they are two states and little birds are only about that big. So what? Oh, come on, let's go swimming. It'll be too cold soon. I don't feel like it. You, you can go. Okay. Oh, it's my birds. They're gone, even just the little ones. Of course they have, but they'll be back in the spring. You'll see. says they are his birds, while Richie says they are his. Both of them are right, even though the swallows are the same. For the wild birds belong to all of us, to anyone who sees their graceful flight, who hears their call, to everyone who is aware of their existence, who can claim exclusive ownership of the Canada goose, for instance. The birds may build their downy nest in western Quebec, and there hatch out their young. The goslings may first learn to walk on Canadian soil and first learn to swim in the clear waters of Lake Mistassini. But one autumn day, led by the parent birds, they take to the air. They leave the lake that has been their home. The long journey lies ahead. The bleak Laurentian shield slips back beneath the even rhythm of their flight. They pass over the forest lands of the North Country. Their marked formation is certain token of the summer's end. At the Ottawa River, site of the Dominion's capital, the flock is thick with new families that have joined it on the way. Southwestward they have come across Quebec, and joined by others from the western shores of Hudson's Bay, they reach the end of the Ontario Peninsula before turning toward the east. Over the fertile farms and rich orchards of Ontario they fly. Over the network of towns and villages. Toronto reels below their sky maneuver. A new world, Thames, guides them toward Detroit. And one night, their honking may be heard high above the city street. And here they change direction. Heading eastward, they swarm over the farmlands of Ohio. And over the industrial centers of Pennsylvania. They climb to nearly 5,000 feet while crossing the Appalachian chain, last barrier to the lovely valleys of the Shenandoah and the Potomac. They cut across West Virginia in a corner of Virginia, and then they skirt another capital. At Washington, a thousand mile journey is nearly at an end, for well, the Canada geese will spend the next six months on the marshes of Chesapeake Bay or in sheltered inlets along the Atlantic coast from Cape Delaware to South Carolina full-fledged residents now of a new country by virtue of the laws of nature and their power of flight. A thousand miles are nothing. Borders do not exist. For the birds have in their wings a passport to the world. Most perfect of all flying machines, they can walk on the water. Or soar at 50 miles an hour. 
A fish hawk seems to hang in midair. Or it can plunge at a hundred miles an hour to catch its furtive prey. While the falcon swoops to safety in a fraction of a second. A transport plane would fly for two hours on a single pint of gasoline if it could match the fuel economy of its feathered competitor. Most remarkable is the ruby-throated hummingbird, making 75 wing strokes every second. Wing strokes that are only visible with the help of super speed photography. The hummer weighs less than an eighth of an ounce and measures three and a half inches from stem to stern. It builds its nest throughout the eastern half of North America. But by fall each year, young and old foregather on the western shores of Florida to undertake a thrilling feat. In one night, the hummingbird crosses the Gulf of Mexico, a non-stop blind flight of more than 500 miles, accomplished in less than 10 hours, high above the inland sea to the shores of Yucatan. He flies over the site of ancient Mayan glory toward the highlands of Central America, where he will spend the winter months flitting about under the semi-tropical sun in search of insects and honey. And here, high overhead, Richie's swallow may be one of a passing flock. For the barn swallows have been traveling for weeks over the Mississippi Valley, through Texas and Mexico, from their nests in the great expanse of territory between Alaska and Indiana, they are flying to a warmer winter in the southern continent. They pass over pre-Columbian temples in their southward flight. The ranges of Honduras and Nicaragua and the palm trees of Panama. They will fly over Colombia and Venezuela, high above the Orinoco, high above the dense jungle. They may rest at night along the mighty Amazon, neighbors of a flock of sandpipers that summered in Greenland, just one of the 200 different species that migrate between North and South America. Some of our barn swallows may even cross over the lofty Andes. Over the citadels of Incan princes, to their winter homes along the Peruvian coast. But most of the swallows have come through the Mato Grosso in Bolivia down to the Paraguay River. Some will spend the winter in the tall grasses of the Chaco, finding food and rest 7,000 miles from the nest where they were hatched. Others will keep moving night and day. They will leave the piranha behind. The goal of their epic flight, the broad pampas of Argentina, or the wild plains of Patagonia. Ritchie's birds have become Ricardo, the birds of a hemisphere. Because the migrant flocks cover so vast an area, no single community can protect them. No simple measures can guarantee their safety. In one area, there is a need for sanctuary. In another, controls against excessive shooting. Headquarters of international cooperation is the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Each year, the service distributes thousands of numbered aluminum bands. Some go to its own field staff. The banding is quick and painless. And the bird returns to its travels someday, perhaps, to add a new fact to our knowledge of migration. In other localities, responsible bird students are licensed to trap the wild birds by various approved methods. Often, when there are many birds to band, the work is done in large parties. Banding requires a firm but gentle hand, for the proud wearer is fragile and must be uninjured when he is released. Handling the nestling is even more of a problem, since its tiny body can easily be hurt. Banding officials work in the remotest sectors, from the Yukon to Mexico, from one ocean to the other, every season, every year. The band numbers are checked in the field and later entered on the official forms that are sent to Washington. Often these notes reveal new facts for the distribution files. The cards report the occurrence of birds in different localities. 
Millions of observations indexed according to species and geographical distribution. From these cards are plotted the species maps that show at a glance where the birds will be in any season. 30,000 letters a year report the band numbers that are found on wild birds. From all parts of the hemisphere they come, in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. They tell interesting stories. Often the birds have re-entered the traps where they were first banded. Their numbers are recorded before the birds are released again. Sometimes they are caught in traps thousands of miles away. Many reports come from hunters who happen to bring down a banded bird. Occasionally, the band itself is sent to Washington. But only the number is necessary for filling out the banding report card. A mechanical system makes it possible to sort the cards and coordinate their information. From these records, it has become apparent that the birds follow four broad paths year after year. The Atlantic Flyway contains the migration routes of the bobolink, the Connecticut Wobbler, and a host of others. The Mississippi Flyway is used by ducks geese, barn swallows, and thrushes. Pintails and redheads use the central flyway. The Pacific flyway includes the routes of many game birds that summer in the west. But not all the birds follow these paths. Some, like the blackbird and the grackle, will only cross a few states. Migration may be a matter of only a thousand feet, for the Canada jay merely moves down to a nearby valley in the fall. Shorebirds, like the sanderlings, follow the undulating outlines of our coast. Birds that travel over the ocean are called pelagic migrants. Typical are the gannets, who never come ashore except for a yearly visit to the remote rocky ledge, where they lay their eggs and raise their young. But why do so many birds carry out these long and dangerous flights twice each year? What is the reason for the phenomenon of migration? No one is certain. No one knows why they travel to the northern portion of their range to reproduce and raise their young. Why must a cormorant come to northern Labrador to find his mate? Why does the myrrh leave Maine? The common tern has conquered half a hemisphere. Why does it forsake Brazil when nesting time is near? Even the staid long-eared owl is a confirmed traveler. The flicker wants a northern tree for his nest. The killdeer will fly from Chile to British Columbia to find his summer home. While the black-necked stilt will go from Colorado to Costa Rica for the winter months. The loon that lived in North America long before the Ice Age, still shuttles up and down the continent, like the handsome Avocet. Long distance travelers all, but why? The golden plover lays her eggs in the northernmost reaches of Canada. Each year, she defies our knowledge of physics and physiology by flying from Newfoundland to Brazil, over the Atlantic Ocean in 48 hours. Even if we knew how she guides herself across the 2,400 miles of open sea, we would not know why she does it. It's not fear of cold, because the Arctic tern makes one of the longest migrations. Nor lack of food, since the tree swallow was on the wing when his food supply is at its height. One theory explains migration in terms of daylight hours. To eat like a bird is not what many people think. A flicker requires 3,000 ants a day as normal diet. Think of the time that must be spent earning a living for a family with such appetite. And the food must be caught as well as collected. Only in northern latitudes is the summer day long enough to permit some birds to carry out the formidable duties of parenthood. We also know that light stimulates the bird's rate of reproduction. Perhaps the spring migration is an instinctive reaction to this fact. One day we may find the answer in a laboratory, the cause some ductless gland. Meanwhile, the work goes on, for the mystery that provides us with a thrilling story is a constant challenge to the perseverance of the research scientist.
si no hubieras echado tus pájaros, ahora se pudiera jugar con ellos. No, no podrían, porque habían volado hacia Norteamérica. Ya deben de estar llegando. ¿Norteamérica? ¿Cómo te falta un tornillo? Mi papá dice que todos los años se van ahí, que algún día yo también iré para ver su nido. Yes, halfway to the States and Canada, if the month is marked. Millions of birds are on the wing. The time for the great migration has come. The urge to build a nest, to reproduce, is answered by a quickened pulse, a marshalling of energy, and sudden flight. The host of migrants is flying into a new summer in a great free movement across the Americas. They mock the man-made lines by which nations separate themselves. For the birds are free. They are at home in the hemisphere. To them belongs all the land over which their wings carry. And they belong to all the peoples who live in those lands. To some of us who chance to see them on their way, the birds are a symbol of travel, of free movement beyond the distant horizon. To others, the flying host is a reminder of forces in nature beyond the control of man. of the hemisphere into a single natural unit. But to most of us, the arrival of the birds is simply a sign of spring, joyful signal of the year's fresh start, a cue for the renewal of life and hope. 